Uh, yes. Everybody's ready to start? Yes. Okay. All right. I can hear just some noises from my guests. Yes. Microphones. If everybody can mute their microphone, that'll be great. So I'm just going to begin. Uh, I'm going to do the land acknowledgement. Okay. Everybody, okay? Can you hear me? Just not. Yep. Yes, okay. we can hear you. Okay, good. Excellent. So um, my name is Alma Mariñel Arena. I am a member of the Toronto East IS, and I will be chairing the discussion today on Malcolm X and the fight against racism. I am a settler living in Toronto, the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishrabi, the Shipewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wedan, Wedat people, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Metis people. This land is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are coming together today from our homes in places all across Turtle Island. In honoring the ability to gather, we recognize the First Nations, Metis, and Inuit peoples who have inhabited and cared for this land for many millennia. Whatever you live in Turtle Island, we are all treaty people who give gratitude to indigenous people for their wisdom and strength in how we look after each other and the land. Part of each of our reconciliation efforts com compels us to know and understand our colonialism histories, the devastating destruction it has caused and the ways it continues to damage the, li the lives of many. During this COVID-19 pandemic, we witnessed an even clearer view of the disparities in our shared space and work dil diligently each day to ensure the prosperity of all people. Ha as inhabitants of our uh, respective communities, we are advocating to human rights. We must take particular care to ensure we are advocating for the rights, health and safety of indigenous communities. I uh, just want to let you know that this meeting will be recorded. And so please also turn off your video and microphone just to make sure that we have good reception. And now I'm going to introduce our guest, Mohammed Ali Omer. He is a member of the American Federation Musicians Local 149. Mohammed Ali is an MC poet, author, and activist who ups the bar on um, protest music with a hard-hitting section of workers, anthems and greedy front lines, labor narratives designed to instill new energy in the movement for workers' rights. Mohammed has also been writing and leading workshops and training sessions on grassroots anti-racist practices for over a decade. You can follow him on all social media platforms at Socialist Hip Hop and on Spotify under the uh, name Mohammed Ali. So here is Mohammed. Mohammed? Hey, everybody. So I am just going to start off with a new piece. Uh, not too new anymore, uh, but some of you may have heard this, some of you may have not. Um, and it speaks to the theme of anti racism in America. And it goes a little something like this. First verse in a sermon. Its purpose is to service. Racists who asserted that they never would service. Saying every person in a turban is a serpent, making certain with a serpent, making certain on the serpent. We've been Plymouth Rock, El Haj Malik Shabazz. We've been Standing Rock, no pipeline on this path. We've been Willie Lynch, that's W.B. Du Bois. The lesson of oppression lies in wise and house. Mike Pence in the White House got the kids in cages. Mike Brown got gunned down with no explanation. So with no hesitation, we the forsaken for too long. We've been waiting, so we hear here for the taking, taking those who sit in silence of task, taking down white pride worldwide, taking down 
all Nazi scumbags taking back what's ours, taking back what's ours, gotta make racists afraid again. MAGA hat racists afraid again. I don't love to hate, man, that's useless. I hate the hate that hate produces because hate is abusive. So here's what the truth is. The truth is subjective, but it subjugates justice, tool of convenience that's corrupted. And if you won't correct it, then yeah, you guessed it. Truth is, racist shoe fits, wear it. I got brown skin in the game. This ain't a joke, no fairy tale. The emperor wears no clothes. I can see it what it's for, but I can also see hope. I need y'all with me, shout out in support. If you with me, put every racist in a place so they got no escape, make them cower in disgrace. Make racists afraid, refugees feel safe. Make no mistake, making racists afraid. Gotta make racists afraid again. MAGA hat racists afraid again. Muhammad Ali, the socialist vocalist. That was my introduction uh, because I write a lot of anti-racism music, a lot of anti-racism work over the years. And the first person who inspired me uh, was Malcolm X. And I'm going to get into that uh, by first starting off by talking about how Malcolm changed my life. So personally, um, I came to Canada in 1988 in the suburbs of Toronto. And I grew up and not understanding why other kids would violently attack me in school until a few years later. I read the autobiography of Malcolm X that my mom gave me for Christmas, written by Malcolm and Alex Haley. Reading Malcolm's personal stories gave my childhood an epiphany. I understood that I wasn't being personally attacked for no reason because I was doing something wrong, but this thing called racism existed, but I never knew what it was until I came to Canada from Africa. Like my childhood self, Malcolm was a Muslim. Like myself, he grew up from a young age without a father, and like myself, when he succeeded as a youth, academically and otherwise, it only led to more racists being more racist towards him. And that is why I'm honored to share the revolutionary ideas of Malcolm X, because Malcolm made me the anti-racist activist I am today. He's my hero growing up, and he was the father that I never had. Also, it's really important to recognize the importance on non-Black people of color being vocal advocates of anti-Black racism, while concurrently making sure that we're not taking space away from Black voices. As a hip hop artist, I constantly strive to reinforce to my artist community that hip hop is directly rooted in the anti-racism and anti-oppression movements led by black and Chicano Americans of the 1960s and 1970s. All communities and identities are welcome in hip hop culture, but the culture only exists and was created because of the work of our black and Chicano American and Canadian activists and artists from those revolutionary periods. For more on this specific topic though, um, I do have, for more, for more on this specific topic though, I do have articles um, and talks I've given at Marxism and I've published in socialist.ca in the past. If you look up hip hop revolutionary roots on socialist.ca, you should be able to find more of the information that I'm talking about. Now, uh, in terms of Malcolm, I'd mentioned that he grew up experiencing the everyday effects of racism. Born Malcolm Little, not Malcolm X, in Omaha, Nebraska in 1925, his father was an outspoken activist for racial equality. His father, Earl Little, was a Baptist leader who was active as a local leader of the United Negro Improvement Association, an organization whose name is going to come up many times uh, throughout this presentation. And you could say the uh, UNIA was the first predecessor to BLM, Black Lives Matter, because as we know, history does not repeat itself, but it sure as hell rhymes. That's kind of the theme that I want to get into today, that you know, it's not the exact same thing kept happening from the 1920s to the 2020s, but a lot of things have been going on and on. Um, so, like I said, Earl Little is a Baptist leader who was active uh, with the UNIA. Having already moved to Lansing, Michigan, by the time Malcolm X, Earl Little was murdered by white supremacists, by the Ku Klux Klan. They tied him to streetcar tracks and left him there to be run over and murdered. Um, by the time Malcolm was a teenager, the state used racist, racist motivations to remove him and his siblings from their home and place them in the foster care system. Because his dad was an outspoken anti-racist and trying to build community um, as a Garveyite, he was attacked, he was murdered, and after they murdered him, they destroyed his family and ripped his family apart. Um, by the time so Malcolm continued to face systemic racism, both in the foster system and in the education system. Malcolm shared an anecdote in his autobiography where as a straight A student, he's asked by the teacher what he wants to be when he grows up. Malcolm answers that he wants to be a lawyer. And his teacher responds that someone like him would better suited to be a carpenter and goes on to make the argument that Jesus was a carpenter. It's a great profession, 
you're the smartest kid in the class, getting the best marks, straight A student, but people like him should be a carpenter, not a lawyer. This was a regular thing that Malcolm and many other people of color faced. And again, you know, this is the kind of racism that was happening when Malcolm was growing up, and it's the same thing that we see today with the school to prison pipelines. History doesn't repeat itself, but it sure as hell rhymes. The more Malcolm excelled academically, the more racism he would face among his white peers and the system as a whole. You know, and I mean, I could relate to that. Uh, I remember, um, you know, as an immigrant kid who spoke English in Africa, but, and wrote English in Africa, I, you know, would get A plus papers. And more than once, um, it would be an A plus, and underneath it, the note would be, did your parents write the assignment for you? Because apparently, you know, a person of color, an immigrant, could not hand in the best paper, you know, in the suburbs of Ontario in the 90s, uh, according to white teachers. Again, same thing that happened then, it's still happening to the state. Malcolm lived the racism of his generation on a daily basis, which made him the anti-racist anti leader and icon that continues to influence and educate our work to the state. To become the revolutionary icon Malcolm X, young Malcolm Little had to endure the most vile forms of racism. The oppression he experienced was the catalyst to him becoming an agent of change. And as socialists, we recognize this applies to all working class people who experience oppression, not just folks um, who were incarcerated like Malcolm, all of us. Um, experience similar oppressions. The personal experience of oppression becomes the political manifestation of becoming an agent of change. Often we take this approach for granted. Malcolm's life reminds us that as socialists, uh, we need to be vocal about our approach of centering personal experiences of living under oppression as the starting point of our class solidarity. We are not being driven by a nine to five paycheck. We are not being driven by the goal of winning elections. We are motivated by our collective lived experiences of oppression and building a better world for the next generation. And Malcolm lived that, and that manifested into the leader he became. Um, and he became a leader after getting out of prison. Amira, can, can you please go over there? Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, Malcolm uh, you know, became that leader during the, the rise of the civil rights movement before the 60s and into the 60s. And, and I just want to take a second back to remind folks um, you know, what it looked like, because we hear a lot of stories about the civil rights movement, and we hear a lot of stories with Malcolm X, but like you know, we know, you know, history books, the media don't always paint the full picture or an accurate picture. Um, so I wanna share a quick snapshot. You know, the most commonly shared stories you know, are those of Martin Luther King Jr.'s Southern Christian Leadership Council and their fights against the racist Jim Crow laws in the South. Stories like you know, the young child Emmett Teal being brutally lynched while visiting the South. You know, history repeats itself and it rhymes, right? We are seeing, you know, reports all month long of black people hanging by a rope, by a noose, dead, you know, because of these protests. Same thing happened to Emmett Teal half a century ago. Um, stories of Klan costumes and Confederate flags. Same stories back then, same stories today. I guess they, you know, got rid of the Klan costumes, Confederate flags and statues, you know, still fly. But outside the South, where they were fighting Jim Crow, where Martin Luther King was marching, um, the situation was a bit different. It was unique. Black Americans outside the South faced a different kind of poverty, joblessness, and racism. Um, a, good, a good snapshot of that is the Watts riots in 1965, um, spurned on by decades and decades in Los Angeles of residential segregation and police discrimination. Um, th these riots finally popped off in what the, the governor at the time, Pat Brown, called, you know, a fight from the government against guerrillas fighting with gangsters. They just couldn't get it, how these revolutionaries and these gangster folks uh, were together trying to fight for a better system. But again, you know, this is what put Malcolm X in a perfect position, having somebody, um, being somebody who was very articulate, uh, very well-researched, you know, knew his stuff, but also somebody who hustled, who'd been in prison, who understood what it was like, uh, you know, in the everyday urban reality of his community. Um, these riots were responsible spe specifically to two things. One, Proposition 12, a constitutional amendment sponsored by the California Real Estate Association and passed that, in effect, repealed a Fair Housing Act. And again, the reason I bring that up is not because it's, you know, it's a random piece of trivia. It's because we see the same thing happening in America today with changing the zones of, you know, co congressional districts and voting districts where, you know, they use geography to segregate us and to take our power away. They were doing it back then, they're doing it now because history certainly rhymes. And also, the other thing that sparked it was a specific case of police brutality that I'm not gonna get the details of, it's pretty gruesome, where community members reported that police had assaulted a pregnant black woman. It 
again, history sure as hell rhymes. This was very different from what was being described for being happening in the South. In LA, it took 14,000 members of the, our Army National Guard to help suppress the Watts riots. It led to 34 deaths and $40 million in property damages. While what was happening in the South inspired Black folks in the North, it was independent and had a very unique set of characteristics uh, than the South. And someone like Ma Malcolm Little turned Malcolm X, who grew up with that oppression as a child, who grew up having to hustle to put food on the table, who grew up uh, in Boston, who grew up in New York City, who was incarcerated, understood this pain, understood uh, this anger, and knew how to channel it um, in a revolutionary way. Uh, so like I said, Malcolm was incarcerated, um, he believed burglary charges, um, and while incarcerated, um, he joined the Nation of Islam. Um, so the organizations, that, the organizations that filled the leadership and community or organizing gap in the urban north where Martin Luther King was not as active were groups like the Black Panthers, the Drum Movement, and the Nation, which Malcolm joined while, while serving time in prison. Malcolm's disciplined commitment to organizing, his high moral principles, and his ability to motivate, educate, and organize working class folks at the grassroots level, which is key. Malcolm always focused on, on building the grassroots, led to him quickly becoming the most prominent leader of the Nation of Islam. And the Nation was a mass organization. Before 1960, the Nation had approximately 100,000 members. And a very fair criticism of the Nation of Islam was that the organization had always tended to look inward. Which again, you know, you can look at um, Jesse Jackson in the 1980s. You can look at Barack Obama in um, 2008 when he swept to power. And the moment he swept to power, all the infrastructure that had been built at the local level um, through his campaign basically evaporated away because Obama was really focused on the internal workings of the Democratic Party um, and not of the larger grassroots movements. So, and this, the nation took a bit of a similar approach. Um, so, uh, and it's a very fair criticism that they always look inward, focusing on personal growth through devotion to Islam, built, and this is important, building up economic independence within local black communities and focusing on internal membership growth to sustain the work of the organization. The nation did important work, but they were focused on themselves um, and building themselves up as an organization and the spiritual aspect. The nation's roots, um, like I said to be earlier, could be found in the work of Marcus Garvey's UNIA, the, the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League from the 1920s. So what you see in the 60s with the nation is a continuation of the work of, of, of the Marcus Garvey followers, uh, also known as Garveyites. And like the UNIA, the nation looked to carve out their own space in capitalism that then actually rallied challenges to see directly. Uh, the Garveyites, the UNIA folks, they literally wanted to get a ship, put black folks on that ship, literally go back to Africa and build a new community, a new country of American, black Americans in Africa and be like, the system is messed up. We're not trying to change the system. We're literally trying to escape. We're trying to get back on a ship, on a ship to freedom, you know, and, uh, and the nation, similarly, um, want, they didn't want to leave America. They wanted to carve out their own space. They wanted to have their economic independence. They actually wanted geographical independence as one of their long-term goals. They actually wanted segregation, you know, a black America for black Americans. But both have the one thing in common where they were not trying to challenge the system as a whole because we know that the root of the issue is how the system is structured. And it's a fair criticism to say the UNIA and the nation neither want to challenge the system. They want to find their own space to live independent and free within that system. And Malcolm changed all that. How did you know Malcolm changed all that, Amira? You've been reading. No, I said you're doing great. <laughs> Thank you. Malcolm changed all this. Um, as he always looked to challenge the system, Malcolm, always went against the grain. He always stood up to the racist. He always, you know, spoke out against injustice. He always walked the, the more difficult path if, if it was necessary. Um, and he continued to challenge the system and the actors working to uphold the system all the way up to the president of the United States. Anybody could get it when it comes to Malcolm. He would check anybody and everybody that was out of line, that was racist, and that was oppressive. Um, Malcolm would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the racists and the institutions that protected them. He would go to Harvard and do debates. He would go on every main, uh, you know, main TV show on ABC, NBC, you name it. He'd go right up there, toe-to-toe -to -toe in a debate with the racists, toe-to-toe -to -toe in a debate with these respected uh, journalists and call out all the politicians. Not only called out the U.S. government, he regularly 
called out the Democratic Party for what it was. Again, history sometimes rhymes. Because what we're seeing with Malcolm calling out the Democratic Party and calling out the US government is a lot of what we've seen from Bernie and AOC. And um, yeah, you know, you, you know I, I will say it, Malcolm was a 60, 1960s version of AOC and Bernie. And this was, and, and the interesting thing is, we have to remember that Malcolm is not an independent actor. He's not an author, professor, just doing his own thing, saying what he feels like when he feels like. He is representing an organization, a mass organization, the Nation of Islam. And what he was doing in picking fights with every racist uh, was in direct contrast to the strategy of the rest of the leadership of the Nation of Islam, who were more focused on internal building. Um, as Malcolm's more public and direct approach continued to gain support because he was talking that real talk and people were nodding their heads. Um, it gave him more prominence as a national leader. And in him becoming more prominent as a national leader, he was like, this helps me build my grassroots because New York City, you know, we're getting so many people joining the nation in New York City and New York's growing and that's my focus and I am happy. But the other leaders uh, grew fearful. They grew fearful that Malcolm was more prominent than them, more respected on the national scale outside of the nation than them. And grew fearful that he may use power or something along those lines specifically like there was many, many, many people in the leadership that felt this way, but specifically the leader, the top leader of the Nation of Islam, Elijah Muhammad, and his successor, Louis Farrakhan, who leads the nation to this day, were two of the main folks who were afraid that Malcolm was out for power and out to take over the Nation of Islam, which he clearly was not, because there's a, a, a lot um, of facts that show that that was not his interest at all. In a weird self-fulfilling prophecy, though, of being afraid that Malcolm would take his clout and take his followers and put them behind him, the nation suspended Malcolm in 1963 that ironically led to him leaving the organization and creating his own independent movement that brought along a lot of the activists and a lot of the Muslims uh, with him leaving the nation of Islam. Now, now this just didn't happen um, out of nowhere. It was obviously building up because Malcolm would continue to tackle every single situation, you know, take on the president, take on the politicians, take on the media, take on the racists. Uh, but um, there's one thing, um, that, that changed a lot. Um, and that was December 1963, when the US President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. In a public statement, Malcolm went directly against the instructions because the nation knew what they, they were guessing what Malcolm was gonna do. He was gonna talk some real talk. So they jumped ahead, they were like, you are not to say anything about the president being assassinated. But Malcolm went on to say these famous words that I think a lot of folks may know or may you know, seem to remember, the chickens have come home to roost. Being an old farm boy myself, chickens coming home to roost never did make me sad. They've always made me glad. Meaning the violence and hatred created by white society was to blame for Kennedy's death. And the quote actually echoes a quote made by Kennedy himself, which was, those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. And of course, Kennedy was talking about overseas, about needing to win over allies in the Cold War and the, these um, countries that were not aligned with the Soviet Union or America and to not just try to invade every single country but actually win them over. Uh, but Kennedy did not have as much energy or interest in applying that same principle to what was happening at home in America, specifically with the black community, which is the Irish. Um, he also said, um, so sorry, to continue. Um, on March 8th, 1964, only a few months later, after Malcolm was suspended uh, from the nation for 90 days, he officially uh, announced he was branching out independently and he said the following words, and I quote, about him leaving the Nation of Islam and starting his own new organization. It is criminal to teach a man not to defend himself when he is a constant victim of brutal attacks. It is legal and lawful to own a shotgun or a rifle by law. We believe in obeying the law. He also said this to the nation. The Nation of Islam has gone as far as it can because it was too sectarian and too inhibited. Again, history sure rhymes. Jesse Jackson in the 1980s, Barack Obama, 2012, when he would not, from 2012, 2013, 2014, Barack Obama would not do anything because he just wanted to win the midterms, take back the Congress, and ironically, in not doing anything, the Democrats lost the midterms, did not take back the House, and set the stage for Donald Trump to come in two years later because after losing the midterms and not being able to push through real legislation, uh, Obama talking about 
Pell Grants and giving you know, tuition relief for students it was great talk, but he couldn't pass the law because for years leading up to it, he did nothing because he just wanted to win an election first. And in doing nothing, he lost the election. Similarly, the nation you know, would not speak out for so many things happening in the 60s. There's a long, long list that I'm not going to get into right now. But in um, you know, focusing just on themselves and not speaking the, you know, that real talk, they had reached their limit. They had reached their shelf life, just like the Democratic Party of today. Ma Malcolm, while remaining a devout Muslim, actually shifted to creating a non-religious big tent um, organization of African unity, modeled after the Pan-African Organization of African Unity. And he created the Organization of Afro-American Unity. Um, after twice going abroad, uh, once being kicked out of the nation of Islam, Malcolm saw non-American examples of the perils of capitalism and imperialism, as well as strategies and principles being used to combat these perils. Malcolm became an internationalist, linking the struggles of black Americans to that of oppressed people across the globe. Before, Malcolm was like, black people need to Free. We need our own freedoms, our own economic rights. But now, having seen the world, he realized this was more than just about Black America. There was a pandemic happening, a pandemic of imperialism and capitalism. Um, again, with the, and, and yeah, um, the two heads of the same oppressive beast. Malcolm was exposed to new united movements that brought together many different people facing many different forms of exploitation by the system, pushing him towards the realization that what was required was a revolutionary transformation of society. Something that some folks like the Black Panthers and James Baldwin were saying, but other folks like Martin Luther King and Jesse Jackson, who was very active at the time in the 60s, were not saying. One, and he talked about a revolutionary transformation of society, one that was not going to be possible as long as capitalism was running the show. These are the words of Malcolm X that the media, you know, will, will not be as quick to share with you. He unequivocally renounced his views that all white people were to blame for racism in America. He said, we will work with anyone, with any group, no matter what their color is, as long as they are genuinely interested in taking the type of steps necessary to bring an end to the injustices that black people in this country are afflicted by. Again, history sure as hell rhymes. Just think about what we're, what we're seeing right now um, throughout America. Look at NASCAR coming out as anti-racist, so many organizations, so many groups, so many publications being like, no, we are here to end injustice. And, and you know what, you know, Black Lives Matter, like, let's go, let's collaborate, let's do this, let's do that, let's make this happen. Malcolm was saying the exact same thing in the, in the mid 1960s. Um, in May of 1964, just a couple months later, um, just a couple months after officially leaving the nation, Malcolm uh, spoke at a socialist forum in New York City. And he said this, one of my favorite Malcolm X quotes, you can't have capitalism without racism. And if you a person, and if you find a person without racism, and you happen to get that person in a conversation, and they have a philosophy that makes you sure they don't have the racism in their outlook, usually they're socialists or their pol political philosophy is socialism. Quote, unquote, the words of Malcolm X verbatim. Perhaps the most clear quote from Malcolm to highlight a shift towards an intersectional revolutionary set of politics is when he said, we are living in an era of revolution and the revolt of the American Negro, his words, is part of the rebellion against the oppression and the colonialism which has characterized this era. It is incorrect to classify the revolt of the Negro, his words, as simply a radical conflict of black against white or purely an American problem. Rather, we are today seeing a global rebellion against the oppressor the exploited against the exploiters. Sadly, as Malcolm's new projects began to gain a lot of momentum, he was assassinated on February 1st, 1965, only a year after starting his new organization. As he was preparing, and he was assassinated in February, as he was preparing to address the OAAU in Manhattan's Audubon Ballroom, Malcolm himself, as recently as two days prior, had pointed to the nation being behind the death threats and the firebombing of his home earlier. And, and he passed away not being able to fulfill the work that he had set out for himself and set out uh, for Black America. But there's a lot of lessons um, that we can learn from his practices and his words. And I need a little break from Ayamira to talk about how Malcolm X contributed many ideas and practices that laid the groundwork. One second, please. Malcolm X contributed many ideas and practices that laid the groundwork for so much of the grassroots organizing that had come that was to come for the next 55 years after his assassination. I'm just going to go through over a little bit of it, and then um, then we're going to move into a discussion. 
Um, he was an early champion of working with an intersectional approach, um, one that included a class critique of capitalism, while also maintaining his focus, first and foremost, on combating racism faced by Black Americans. He showed us that we can fight for our own liberation, first and foremost, while building allyship and having an intersectional lens. Uh, Malcolm was one of the early pioneers to show us this work uh, how this work would look in practice at the grassroots level. A lot of people talked about it. A lot of people wrote about it. A lot of university professors published something about it. But Malcolm was doing it on the ground at a, in a grassroots way. Um, he famously said that he would work with anyone who was committed to the liberation of Black America. While he did not go as far as his contemporaries like James Baldwin or Fred Hampton, Malcolm did contribute much um, to these ideas these, um, and these day-to-day -day actions that we put into practice today. You know. He, he wasn't perfect. There was definitely some limitations to as far as he went when it came to intersectionality, but he showed us how to put it into practice half a century ago. And we've learned a lot from that, all of us. Also, history sure arrives. Malcolm, yeah, you have to stop, please. Malcolm was one of the, you know, yeah, can you go please? Can you please go? Malcolm was one of the staunchest critics of the Democratic Party rec and rec Malcolm was one of the staunchest critics of the Democratic Party and recognized that elections alone would not bring about the freedom that Black Americans were striving for. While he reached out to folks like Martin Luther King and was willing to work with anyone and everyone who shared his goals, it was clear that the political party system was a broken system. A, bro a system broken on purpose to serve the haves at the expense of the have-nots, and therefore groups need to be or to organize independently of the established political class and their actors. Malcolm wasn't the only person to say this, but again, how many folks was he, were putting these ideas into practice at the grassroots level half a century ago, down with the Democratic Party. He influenced so many of his contemporaries, including the Black Panthers, the Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement, and the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. He was unapologetic about the role that racism played in the American system. Unlike other forms of oppression, Malcolm was very clear and unapologetic about racism being the tool that capitalism used to build the wealth of the nation from its for its white citizens. Definitely, definitely thumbs down to that one. Slavery and the oppressive laws that followed it, like Jim Crow, allowed white America to exploit the lives, the labor, and the economic output of black America. And that wealth has been passed down generation after generation in white America, while black America continued in a spiral of poverty and injustice. Malcolm is one of the most vocal and unadulterated voices about racism's role in building the American system. And he is, and had he not been so vocal, this may be something that most progressives look at as an obvious conclusion, right? Malcolm was one of the first folks to do this, talk this talk, and be, feel this strongly about, uh, you know, capitalism and slavery and the economic implications of that and how it relates to the state. Nowadays, we're all like, yeah, we all agree, this is common sense. But he was one of the first folks to say it as strongly as he did that led to um, all of us now being, well, I hope all of us are like, yeah, yeah, you know, America was built on the backs of slaves and we can all accept that. And, that, and that's, a, that's a very major contribution to, to what Malcolm, um, to the work of Malcolm X. So um, now I would like uh, to, um, well, I was, I was going to talk about uh, Malcolm X and Black Lives Matter today, but I'm thinking that um, there's gonna be a lot of discussion around the protests and the riots uh, and Black Lives Matter. So rather than like conclude on that, I would instead like to just share one more piece for y'all. This is an older piece, but it's from my Libra of Love um, album. And um, it's called The Daughters of Asada and it's the third verse and it goes something like this. We hear in one ear, elders saying, yo, let's go. In the other ear, elders saying, yo, let go, peddling hope. So we believe in going forward. But remind me why we heading overseas and getting tortured. They ain't speaking with the same voice. Truly, they never did. They jailing us with labels. What a clever trick to lock our mind in glass jars to contain us and detain us. Fill the jaws of bubbles of champagne and cocaine dust. Few understand what I'm talking about. For a rope and concrete is a flower that sprouts. Pox said that rose is stronger than the one from Fresh Meadows. And even he wondered, does heaven have a ghetto? Pop, Chris, Public Enemy, we charred these albums. For my generation, those the new Martin and Malcolms. Lessons time tested, like sun dial shadow makers. So it don't cost no mule and no 40 shallow acres. We the sons of Madiba, daughters of Asada, sisters of Mumia, 
brothers of Gavara. We the sons of Mumia, daughters of Asada, sisters of Mumia, brothers of Gavara. Wonderful. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you, Mohammed. Great. Excellent. Uh, excellent speech. Um, does anybody has any question? Comment? You can ask now and or you can send us your questions or comments on the chat. Anybody? Can you hear me? Thank you so much, Mohammed. That was wonderful. Yes. Question. I can read a question. Um, okay. Not a question, comments from Michel. Fantastic. Thank you, Mohammed. Okay. Trevor, uh, do you want to ask a question? There is a question from Trevor on the chat. What do you see as the next step for the movement, Mohammed? So th this is really interesting because um, um, I've been one of those folks who's been a big proponent of like um, supporting the youth and like recognizing how much work the youth are doing more than a lot of us seem to recognize. That's not just because like, you know, I, I realized out of nowhere, right? Um, I tour a lot with my music. So I've gotten to see a lot of youth events. Just, uh, one second, everybody, well, sorry, sorry. Um, what, what, like one specific example, but there's many of them. Uh, I've been, I performed at youth uh, labor summits. Also the, the PowerShip Youth Climate Change um, Conference last year in Ottawa. Um, but every time I see these youth events organized by youth, high school, college, university youth, uh, young folks doing amazing organizing, level organizing, it, it made me realize that like, the, this next generation on the come up that's actually taking the stage right now are phenomenal and unstoppable. And I've been saying this and like, yo, you, you should have power shift, this will blow your mind. But now this year we're actually seeing the youth come into their own beyond the climate change work that they've been doing last year. Now with the BLM and BLM solidarity work, um, I, I think the next steps for us is to recognize that there is more space to win and more space for revolutionary radical ideas than we had realized. You know, we've lost a lot of fights. You know, Stephen Harper, Doug Ford, Ontario, John Tory, Rob Ford, the list goes on and on. And, um, and we lost a lot of big fights. We've won some big fights, like 15 in fairness uh, and whatnot. But we need to recognize that well, this next generation is really good and they're winning and we have to let them lead. And if we're like not sure if this is going to work, and you know, a 20 year old, a 22 year old said, trust me, it's going to work. I'm talking to to, to my, my peers, we have to trust them because they're showing us that they've been nailing it with climate change before this year. They're nailing it with anti-racism this year and we'll see what comes next. So uh, where do we go? We have to let the, the, the 20 year olds, the 22 year olds lead because they're doing a phenomenal job. That's true, wonderful. Just a reminder to everyone that you can raise your hand if you have a question and you want to speak. Uh, there is a little icon uh, on the chat, I believe, or at the bottom of the screen, and you can click, so you can raise your hand and you can ask your question or make a comment. Okay, anyone? I see a few questions. Uh, anybody? I can't see anybody. Um, uh, I think John Bell Pauline. has his hand up. Yeah. Where is he? I can't see it. Okay. In the participants. Participants. That was uh, oh. fantastic. Uh, right. uh, Ali, uh, terrific. Um, and, you know, Malcolm's a hard guy to sum up. And uh, in a short period of time, he had a lot to say. He had a lot. He wrote a lot, um, and people should just dive in and uh, and read what you know. Read the original. Read what he's got to say. Um, it really uh, pays off. But I want to talk about um, issues of violence. And uh, I, I, 
you know, I've got on my mind the, the, the terrible judgment that came down today in the city of Toronto, uh, the two, um, the, the, the off-duty policeman and, uh, and his brother who mercilessly beat uh, DeFonte Miller um, and basically got away today with a, a, a slap on the wrist. Um, and we got uh, to witness what the media, the way the media covers it, um, with one of the reporters actually saying, virtually saying, I haven't got the quote in front of me, that, well, they kind of, they deserved it because they were breaking into cars, which was never proven. It was an allegation from the cops, but it was never proven and, and, uh, and it was not, it basically it's completely off base as for any kind of a journalist. So. We have, on the one hand, people decrying the violence of Black Lives Matter. They decried the violence they, that they said Malcolm X was espousing, but it was very clear with Malcolm. And I think that it's clear if we look at what's really going on today with Black Lives Matters, that any kind of violence is self-defense. And, uh, and Malcolm was clear he said, anybody who puts their hands on me, I'm going to, I'm going to fight back. And, uh, and, and that is uh, a very big threat. Uh, uh, and it's, it, it then becomes um, uh, more a, a bit of a context for his assassination and how the Nation of Islam worked together with the CIA to to uh, uh, to uh, assassinate Malcolm, as they did, um, assassinating the leadership of the Black Panthers, which was formed just a year, just like a year after Malcolm's death, and built built on his legacy, but took the idea of that self defense. I mean, that was the name of the of the Black Panther Party. It was the Black Panther Party for self defense. That was the proper name for for that organization. Um, so we have to be really clear that we don't fall into bullshit arguments about the R movement being the source of violence. Um, and if just to, to remind people that it was what, what are we on? F like five years since Ferguson, five cent years since the murder of Michael Brown and Ferguson. And in that time at minimum seven organizers of the original organizers of the, that first Black Lives Matter movement have, have turned up dead. Um, and, and what the, the press calls mysterious circumstances. Um, and we know that it again, is the, it's the work of the state assassinating their enemies. And we have to be, you know, we have to be aware of it. We can't be paralyzed by it. Um, and we have to be prepared to fight to uh, defend ourselves. I just want to add one thing to that, to what John was saying, but also going back a little bit to what Trevor was saying, um, in terms of leading and pushing hard, right? Um, I think it was maybe five years ago, maybe a little bit less than five years. Actually, no, definitely less than five years because Black Lives Matter was launched five years ago. Um, so I think three, four years ago, uh, Black Lives Matter in Toronto, um, were at the Pride Parade, leading the Pride Parade as, you know, the official formal guests. And towards the end of the parade, they sat down and they wanted to have a talk about racism and stop the Pride Parade. And yeah. we saw it was two things happening. If you, if you viewed social media, half folks were like, this is so wrong. How can you ruin a parade to yeah. talk about police presence yeah. in the parade? And other folks were like, yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, yeah, and a few years later, we we now see the folks were like, and the, sorry, there's a third, there was a third camp of like, um, let's pick fights we can win. Let's maybe, I'm not against what Black Lives Matter did, but I don't think it's gonna. That's the best tactic. And one thing that we're, we're seeing today, and one thing Malcolm was great at, was pushing hard and being principled the tactics and calling a spade a spade, like John was saying. Um, and that work that Black Lives Matter Toronto did was part of that work that built this consciousness to, for there to be an unprecedented level of support for Black Lives Matter, Black Americans, Black Canadians that we've never seen in this continent. 
and the folks were like, I don't know if that tactic is going to be useful. Maybe it's a bit too much direct action have clearly been proven wrong. And we need to push hard. We need to be principled. We need to be strategic, but we have to push hard. Just like folks did 10 years ago to this day uh, during the G20, um, you know, folks, you know, strategize and plan for months and months and months. I was in those planning meetings and we had a good strategy, a good plan. Uh, we organized hard, uh, just like Black Lives Matter did a few years ago. It's very important uh, to push as far as we can and not, yeah, not, not think that it's not possible and not discourage folks who are pushing hard. You know, folks who are camped out of City Hall right now, we shouldn't discourage them and be like, you know, wait, wait for City Hall to pass a motion. It's like, no, camp out. I'm going to go out there and join you. We need to really lead by example when it comes to that revolutionary fervor and that revolutionary sentiment. We need to lead that example and, pu and push harder. Totally, yes, I agree. I remember that time that, yeah, the uh, Black Lives Matter stopped the pride and some people were like, good for them. And some people were like, why? They couldn't understand that. That's the point of uh, the uh, parade. It's a uh, protest. It's not just like a show. And uh, great. Oh, and uh, sorry, and just one more point. Um, so there was a question in the comments uh, about Malcolm and um, Indigenous folks. And I mean, mm -hmm. Malcolm X was a trailblazer when it came to this. Uh, he called out genocide for what it was, again, half a century ago. Talked about how mm -hmm. America was built on the blood of dead, first, of dead indi first Indigenous nations. folks. Talked about the need for reparations um, and talked about how, um, yeah, just how, how, how bloody massacre and a genocide, called the genocide what it was, which very few people uh, we're actually using that language and being that strong in their common condemnation of the U.S. government. And we can't forget about that in terms of Malcolm and his solidarity work. Yeah, um, I, I see hands up. I believe, Pauline, were you next after John Bell? Sure, I can go. Uh, that was a great uh, talk, Ali. Uh, great. And it sort of made me think about what's happening right now because i think when you were talking about the way that malcolm's ideas started to shift you know before his death about a year before his death uh, i think if we look at what's going on today and how far the movement has gone i mean i think you make a really good point about who's leading you know it's actually young black people who are leading this um and which is which is very important um i saw an interview with uh, cornell west last week on uh, cnn i think and it was pretty powerful he's a black academic in the u.s but he's always been an activist as well and um, they he was talking about how president donald trump may be fantasizing about a coming race war because definitely that's what trump is trying to foment is kind of racism uh, against blacks um, but but Cornell West said the good news is that if there was a race war we've got lots of white brothers and sisters on our side now and he sort of pointed out that if you look at where the protests are happening they're happening in major cities obviously like LA New York etc but they're also happening in very small towns in the Midwest where there are not where there's not huge populations of black or Latinx people but it's it's Basically, I think what this movement has done is create a space in which millions of people feel that they can speak out against racism. And, 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 and the, the silenced voices of black working class people are now at the forefront of, of those movements. But they're finding an echo, I think, am, among millions of white people for whom racism is, you know, an utter abhorrence i mean something that people hate and it's it's uh, led to things i th the one of the other hopeful things i think about the current moment is that some of the stuff that's happening you know it would be hard to imagine even six months ago for example in minneapolis today the city or city count not today but recently the city council voted to disband the police and to replace it with some form of community organization now that doesn't mean that's going to happen automatically but the fact that it's even on the table i think is a testament to the strength of the movement and uh and i think if you look at malcolm x he definitely, I think, is one of the voices that, that inspires that kind of 
that kind of activism and that kind of um, that kind of power, that powerful um, strategy. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Um, there is three hands up, I believe so. I'm not sure who's so, but you're next. Go ahead. There you are. Go ahead. Um. Hello, can you hear me? Do you have a question? Who's uh, said SO? Not sure. Go ahead. I don't hear anyone. Hello? Okay. okay. Oh, Carolyn next then. And so Carolyn, yeah, Carolyn, you're next. I don't know. I can't hear. Okay. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, go Thank ahead, you. Carolyn. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, Carolyn, you're Carolyn. muted. You're new. There we go. Thank you very much. Uh, great, great talk. And uh, just uh, uh, before I get into the co comments that I had sort of got in my head, uh, what Celine had said about Cornell West's quote is so extraordinary because so many people, certainly in my union, the United Steelworkers, and I see there are a lot of steelworkers on this call, uh, Darren from Hamilton and Michelle and uh, and uh, Christine and uh, John and Alex from Toronto and I see Felicia from the elementary teacher so many trade unions are here but before I get into that which I want to uh, follow up a little bit um, Cornell's West quote struck me as so important and I was reading a little bit about Fred Hampton recently and people probably know that Fred Hampton was a, a young leader in the Black Panthers who was murdered in his home with a number of others when at the age of 22 or 23 years uh, in, uh, in Chicago uh, way back when in, in that era. And uh, he, he had been an organizer since his teenage years. He grew up in Chicago. And what he was saying is essentially what Cornell West was saying, in which we're now beginning to see in the streets, that the, the black people and Hispanic or Mexican people, as he called them, and poor whites, that is the way we have to get together. That's the way we're going to come together. And that's where we're going to overturn racism and, and the system that perpetuates it. So I, I think the fact that we're seeing this, as Cornell West said, is so, so important. And uh, I, I wanted to pick up on the, on the trade union uh, thread a little bit because um, I, I remember, and being quite young at the time, but nonetheless, Martin Luther King and uh, Malcolm X had different approaches. Their ideas were changing. Martin Luther King had recently come out against the Vietnam War. And they came together on a platform in New York City. And that platform was a Service Employees International Union. Uh, stage at a strike that was being held by healthcare workers and they came together and they showed their support for working class strikes working class unity and and the role of the working class in making change and that was very shortly before martin luther king was then killed in memphis at the sanitation workers strike which were primarily a, a, a black workers a black male workers strike and that very uh very uh uh, a memorable uh, sign that I am a man that those workers were showing and that that strike in the end was one and and I think that that, that it is so important today as as we look at what's going on around us and those huge uh, uh, wonderful multiracial uh, demonstrations that are taking place in the United States in Canada around the world so important so critical and I know that you know when I have been at some of those uh, rallies and marches in Toronto when I've seen steelworker flags or OPSU flags or CUPE flags, it's hugely important. And I remember Labor Council got a call when we put out a, I said the union's got to be out there. The carpenters called up and said, is it all right if we just wear our t-shirts or should we bring our flags too? And that kind of uh, sentiment is, is, just, is just so, so important today. And uh, I think that when you look at what's happened um, 
and it's got to be more of it. It's just beginning to happen in huge ways. But when the International Longshore uh, uh, Worker and Warehouse Union uh, chose to strike just recently ago, a few days ago, in 35 ports across the Canada and U.S. border, all the way up the West Coast, uh, shutting down all of those uh, all of those ports in support of the movement for Black Lives Matter. This is hugely, hugely important. And when the amalgamated transit in Minneapolis, New York City, and perhaps other cities refused to drive the buses that were intended by police to uh, to uh, take uh, arrested demonstrators to detention centers and said no, which really made a difference in the numbers that the police could actually arrest. And I think it's so critical because our unions are made up of so many people, certainly in the city of Toronto, incredibly diverse and you know people who come out of the communities and and we have to those of us who are trade unions have to push so hard to make sure that our unions not only put out the nice statements which they're all doing but actually show in the streets that we are there we are there in this struggle and uh, I, I think it will make a huge difference because when you see the economic harm it can do to the uh, captains of capital if you want to say when all the ports in the in, in on the west coast of, of this continent north america are shut down it's hugely important and this was the same union that shut down the delta port in vancouver when the wet'suwet'en people were uh fighting uh, the rcmp and called out for solidarity uh they went to that solidarity picket at the delta port and said we're prepared to stand with you and so this is hugely hugely important it, it makes me so um I think hopeful about what the possibilities are because with all the differences and all all, all all the things that we have to learn about each other and understand the oppressions, et cetera, that that all of us face in our different if our in our different ways, the unity is so critical. We have to come overcome those differences and build the unity because as so as has been said so often in the past, you know, they are few, we are many. We have a capacity as Cornell West and so many others have said, uh, you know, uh, Fred Hampton, Malcolm X in the past, we can do it. And today, what's happening with the COVID, all that crisis, the economic crisis that came through it, and now what's happening that has just, just captured captured the, the hearts and souls of so many progressive people around the world. We've got to organize that into a force that can really make change that will be significant and be permanent. So I'll leave it at that. That's great. Any comment, anybody? Um... So we couldn't hear you. So I see a question for everyone. Um, let me see. Um, uh, I can. I, I can see that there is a question, but hold on. Or uh, we can take the next person who has the hands up. Michelle. Michelle Robidoux. You can go ahead. Hi, thank you. I just, I just wanted to mostly say that um, coming back to the talk, that um, sorry, I'm gonna just, I've got to do um, The talk was fantastic, and uh, I think if there's one thing in the midst of everything that's going on right now, um, people are looking for ideas, people are looking for inspiration, and one of the first things I ever read that made me political was a book called Malcolm X Speaks, and it's his speeches. And you have to, there are, at most of that stuff is available online, but it's important, I think, people read it. Uh, just like um, uh, James Baldwin, when you, when you hear his voice, how, how little has changed, and that anger, but also the, the courage, the incredible courage it took to, to be who he was and, to, and to, to lead in the way that he did. So I just want to say that because uh, it's, it's a time when I think ideas, um, voices like that are super important. And of course, that's, that's one person. We have a rich history, a rich, rich history. You can go back you know, much earlier. You can, you can uh, talk about Frederick Douglass. You can talk about um, indigenous people in this country and what they had to say in the face of colonial oppression. You can read this stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm currently uh, looking at, at some of this writing and it's just like, you know, it, it, it's a direct link. It's a living link with what we're facing today. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that, I mean, Carolyn talked a lot about sort of the, just the incredible, how fantastic it is right now. I don't think we even have, because we're all kind of stuck at home <laughs> mostly, uh, or there's a lot of isolation to get the overall picture, but think of what has changed just in this past few 
short few weeks. It's mind blowing. And I think uh, Oakland was kind of to me the, the when the, the longshore workers went out and there was a big, very big rally in Oakland uh, at uh, just right near the port terminal um, where Boots Riley spoke. And Boots Riley, if people don't know, is, a, is a, a, an artist, a musician, and also made a film, if you haven't seen it, you should see it, called uh, Sorry to Bother You, which is about working, uh, well, it's kind of a futuristic, um, apocalyptic view of working in a call center type of thing. But he, uh, if I can just um, give you a flavor of what he had to say to the crowd that was there, and you can, you can find it on, uh, on YouTube. He said, we have the ability to withhold our labor and shut shit down. We don't want to ask, just ask for things to get better. We want to say it's going to get better or else. Imagine if this wasn't just a one day West Coast shutdown. Imagine if it was like we're shutting down all the West Coast ports until you do one, two, and three. They would be losing billions of dollars, way more money than we would lose, that they would lose from whatever we could do in the streets. So that is the question. What is the strategy? The action by the longshore workers is laying out the strategy. So I found that, I mean, it's a terrific moment that we got to in just a few weeks uh, of, a, of a clarity. Angela Davis also spoke at the same rally and of course is a socialist, uh, uh, you know, from a long time and, 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 and brought the same kind of uh, vision of a kind of class power there that, that is infusing this. So, I just wanted to say those things and say that what we witnessed in the past few years, you know, uh, just, just Friday, a week ago, uh, the comrades at the, uh, at the um, Not Another Black Life and Black Life Ma Lives Matter rally at the police station where they painted defund the police in giant pink letters, um, which was still kind of visible yesterday when they went by. Um, that is built on uh, the Tamil occupation of the gardener. That is built on the, um, of course, the founding of BLM, well, the first demonstration of BLM, but then the founding and the, the uh, shutting down of the Allen Expressway a few years later. It was inspired kind of by that. And then the pride action, which at the time seemed controversial, but for, for God's sakes, uh, you look at it now, uh, what was the issue? We don't want the police in pride. Well, we're now defund the police. So I just wanted to say that it's a fantastic time. And I loved, loved the presentation on this. And I think people, people should let themselves be inspired by this. We, of course, it's not, we can say, oh, Malcolm X, we claim Malcolm X as a revolutionary socialist. We can't do that. But he's a person who, who fills us with that courage and that anger and that clarity of what we are up against and how it could be a very different world. The means to getting there, that's, the whole, that's, that's where we have to talk about socialist organization and socialist ideas and seizing the time today. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Michelle. I, I can see uh, questions. There is a question. Um, what is the best way to engage in this course with people who aren't coming in good faith? Um, Mohammed, do you have any? Can you? No. So I want to start with that one because I love talking about that. Uh, <laughs> okay. No, I mean, like, it's a straightforward thing. And it's like, and I, I get it a lot, right? You know, mm -hmm. uh, people will, you know, they just type in socialist and they see my posts, they see my memes, they see my songs, and they get in the comments and they start talking about Hitler was a national socialist totally. and all this kind of yeah. stuff. They send me direct messages. Mm -hmm. uh, it also happens in public at shows, yeah. at larger events, you know, yeah. where somebody tries to derail a conversation. And, and, the, and the, yeah, the solution is really, really simple and straightforward. It takes practice because these folks really practice and train at getting good at to goad you into conversations that are not being uh, started in good faith, right? Because they want this to get a rise out of you so they can have, usually they want to rise out of you so that they can frame the narrative. Look at these crazy lefties. Look at this person yelling at me. Look at this person getting triggered because I was trying to have a respectful conversation. That's what they say. And that's what they say to other people. And that's what we get conscious of. It's not about the conversation with the person trying to troll you in, um, coming with bad faith it is about the people listening uh, i always refer to a line from jay-z 
A wise man once told me, don't argue with fools, because from far away, others can't tell who's who. So be it on the Facebook comments, be it an actual conversation at a pub or at a rally, I engage with those folks most of the time. Sometimes like low through races for me and I'm like, I'm gonna tag out. Uh, but most of the time I engage with them and I speak to them and I engage with them. And my entire goal is to actually be speaking to the people listening, the people reading the comments, the people standing next to us at the rally. I'm not, I am not trying to convince that person's mind. I'm not even trying to address what they're saying. I am speaking to everybody listening and that is the tool, right? Because if you don't engage, I mean, that's respectful because you know, it's pretty vile stuff, you know, to try to like engage in these kind of conversations without being in good faith. There's actually some good value in that because you're not seeding them that, that, that space and we have the right arguments. All they have is trolls. All they do is get a rise out of us. They don't get a rise out of us and we go toe to toe argument for argument that minimum wage will ruin the economy. You know, we win that conversation as long as we're not focused on debating them, but everybody who cares about minimum wage, everybody who cares about anti-racism, you know, engage with the trolls, but don't talk to them. Talk to everyone listening to the two of you talking. It's simple, and, but it takes practice to do because they're really good at trolling and it, and it is emotionally taxing, 100%. So if you don't want to do it, don't do it. But if you do, recognize it's going to take it, but it's not as easy as it sounds at first. Once you get the hang of it, man, it feels good to shut down trolls and win people over, win their friends over, win their family over. So yeah, so, um, and I, 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 could, I could do a whole 30 minute thing on that. But, but, but the, the point is, it is important uh, because we do have the right arguments, as Michelle was saying, that is why we're revolutionary socialists. Um, Cornell West is, is, a, is a really good one uh, because uh, Cornell West uh, was blacklisted uh, from the White House, from Obama, um, you know, Michael R. Dyson, I, I was the biggest Michael Eric Dyson and Cornell West fan. I got autographed Michael Dar Eric Dyson books. You know, I remember on, you know, tweet, replying to a tweet from him and he remembered me rapping to him years ago in Toronto. And I was so proud that Michael Eric Dyson remembered my rapping. Um, never met Cornell West, would love to. But uh, it broke my heart when Michael Eric Dyson attacked Cornell West on behalf of Hillary and Obama and the, the Democratic National uh, Committee. It was disgusting. Um, but Cornell West stayed principled. He didn't sell out like Dyson sold out. It breaks my heart that Dyson sold out. But Cornell West stayed principled, walked the path, even though he was blacklisted, did not have the same opportunities, was, was smeared. He kept walking the same principled revolutionary path. And today, today, he has been proven right. We don't see Michael Eric Dyson going on CNN right now. We don't see Barack Obama going on CNN. We do see Cornell West being vindicated and it's a beautiful thing because he stayed to his revolutionary principles and that's we have to remember as socialists it's not always easy but if we, if we stick to it it's going to come around you know you know what i mean that the people are going to recognize who's real dyson obama or west and not Kanye West, cornell west um it you know yeah you know the, the truth always comes out um and and yeah and and, and it, it warms my heart to see cornell west be been um be exonerated, I guess. Um, and yeah, and, and, and in terms of, um, you know, social, uh, one thing we have going for us is that socialism, socialism is the answer because it's the real answer. We provide real solutions with real strategies and real tactics and a real plan of how to get from point A to point B with a rich history of having done it and a rich history of having tried and failed, but having done it principle, in a principled way and having learned lessons from our successes um, and um, are not so so successes. And, and I think we, we have to always remember that, that, you know, we hold the moral high ground, but also the experience in doing this stuff. Not anybody can roll out anti-racism work, you know, minimum wage work, workers' rights work the way that we can, because we have this rich history of doing it every day as being, having been done for centuries. And we have to rely on that and puff our chest out and be confident about that without taking up too much space, uh, but being confident um, about it. Um, and yeah, yeah. Um, Michelle beat me to it, which was talking about Baldwin and Boots Riley. I was going to say um, two things I was going to recommend was one, uh, please watch um, If Beale Street Could Talk, which is a movie based on a novel by George Baldwin, and the Boots Riley piece that Michelle had mentioned, Sorry to Bother You, phenomenal satire movie. And when Michelle was speaking, I'll add, I added one more because um, I, I listen to this every year. Um, on the 4th of July, there is um, uh, Frederick Douglass gave a speech about the 4th of July. And uh, it aired, I believe, on PBS. 
but the speech is narrated by James Earl Jones. And every year, you know, I'm, I'm going to be doing it next week. Every year I listen to the Frederick Douglass speech as told by James Earl Jones about the 4th of July, very quick Google search. So, you know, Frederick Douglass on the 4th of July, you know, uh, I am not your Negro, James Baldwin. If Beale Street could talk, James Baldwin. And of course, sorry to bother you. And I, I guess um, I'll, I'll leave it on this note. Not another song, as much as I would love to and she would love to. Um, I'll leave you all with a quote. Um, and this was touched on, I believe, by Carolyn, possibly Michelle. Um, very simple quote that really speaks true uh, today and right now and last week and last month from Vladimir Lenin. It's one most of us has probably, probably heard. There are decades where nothing happens and there are weeks where decades happen. Right now, we are in weeks where decades are happening and we have to keep the momentum up and keep fighting. We, you know, we and just ne ne never let up and let the youth lead and continue to organize on principle with sound strategies, building a large tent like we always do as revolutionary socialists. Malcolm X may not have been a revolutionary socialist, but he was a revolutionary who prioritized hard work and sound strategies uh, based on empirical evidence and working together uh, in unity. So um, Muhammad Ali, socialist vocalist, Amir Omir, peace. Love, solidarity, y'all. Great, thank you, thank you, Mohammed. Excellent. Um, I see uh, Song Lim. Song Lim, you have your hand up. Can you hear Hi. me? Hi. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, my my name is Song Lim. I'm um, from the uh, Toronto East uh, International Socialist. Yeah, last night I uh, kept reading the book, Malcolm X, uh, which was published by Bookmarks in UK. So I couldn't like put down that book, like, you know, it's not a big book, but it was quite uh, uh, dense in terms of content there. Like there are lots of histories from the uh, civil rights movement to, to you know, uh, drum, like, you know, larger revolutionary uh, union movement. It covers well, very well, and uh, as well as the uh, Malcolm X. So um, after finishing that book, like uh, into like uh, morning, like two o'clock, um, like uh, I, like uh, right now, when you see like uh, uh, the scale and then like uh, scope of the like, uh, anti-black racist like protest, racism protest is a far reaching. I originally came from Seoul, South Korea, and this uh, even South Korea, we don't really have a lot of like, you know, um, people of color, like black people there, but there's, there is a demonstration as well. So it was really far reaching. So it's very exciting, like, you know, it's just inspiring me and then, seeing those kind of things was going on in terms of like a whole world and then reading this book was really making me clear that also Malcolm X kind of he was not like a socialist like a, he might have been like if he lived like you know if his political transformation like uh, had happened he might lead to like you know uh, revolutionary socialist but what he was clear on thing, like one thing was that the, like uh, at the end of the, his life, he said like, you know, uh, as long as uh, I'm paraphrasing, as long as uh, capitalism goes on, racism cannot be like, you know, uh, stamped out. So that means like, you know, I guess this time around, we have to really uh, uh, get to the bottom of things at the root of the cause, which is like, I guess, uh, uh, automatically get rid of the capitalism. That's why what uh, Carolyn and uh, Michelle previously said is very important to, to make a link with like working class like uh, into this like uh, movement. Just because um, they are the one like uh, have a, like uh, capacity to get rid of capitalism through over like uh, capitalism. That's why we have to really focus on like, you know, working class into this like a big movement we are witnessing right now. But it's very also 
I'm not like discounting like defund police, abolish police is very important, but we have to, as a socialist, I am socialist, so we have to put that in mind every time, like, you know, even though this, like, you know, centrality of working class is not everybody's, like, you know, radar right now. So, but we have a job to bring that element to this movement. So that this time we have to really, like, you know, trying to we have to get at the root of the cause like you know like uh, breeding this racism like as michelle said like uh, when i read this book nothing really changed a lot like in terms of police brutality and the racism like uh, like uh, 70 80 years ago like uh, the people still like you know brutally like uh, you know terrorized by police and then racism and then education everything was like this, for them discriminated against we still witness this time like uh, because of like you know all the like uh, black or uh, nationalist movement uh, like you know c c civil rights movement like uh, so we have uh, some like a uh, lesson to learn so we have to build on that now we don't have a time to uh, have an illusion for people like Obama or some like middle class, like black people. Like they, so this time we have to really like take into our hands, like working class and then people like, you know, ordinary people without like relying on like establishment as like Malcolm X did, like uncompromised my thing like you know like uh, against the establishment we have to really fight on the street thank you thank you song that was very good comment excellent um let's see i see some comments there is a rebel's guide to Malcolm X, Christine Beckerman, uh, entered in the chat. Thank you, Christine. Uh, maybe we can just uh, take one last round of questions or comments. Uh, anyone? I don't see any hands up. Is it possible for uh, Mohammed to answer Ranjit's question about Malcolm X's work, decolonizing, focusing on indigenous sovereignty? Sure. Uh, Mohammed? For you. We can't hear you. Sorry, yeah, my apologies. Yeah, uh, yeah no, um, I talked to briefly, talking about how Malcolm was one of the first folks to call a spade a spade, call it genocide, talk about how America was blit, built on the blood of, um, of the First Nations genocide on stolen land and uh, the need for proper reparations. Um, yeah, you know, uh, Malcolm was very strong proponent of First Nations rights and calling it exactly, you know, I mean, what it was, which is genocide. Thank you, Mohammed. Any other, any comment, any questions? So before we wrap up and ask Mohammed for final uh, comments or anybody? Also a reminder, after we are done from this meeting, you can just hang out at the end if you like to be. And also I have some announcements before we, we finish. Okay, so Mohammed, maybe you can give us your last comments. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think I touched on uh, most of this already. I think the, um, the the most important thing we have to remember is how much things have changed over the past few weeks. How much a better world is possible, and how we get there um, with our socialist organizing principles and tactics. Uh, with our, our research, with our education, um, and uh, we need to continue doing exactly what we're doing, doing the one day at a time stuff, uh, and slowly building, slowly educating, slowly organizing, building allyship the way we always do, waiting uh, for the bubble to blow up and everybody to uh, hit the streets. And, you know, we have to keep doing exactly what we're doing in times like this, push as hard as we can, 
but in when there's ebbs and it's not flows to continue to organize the exact same way we always organize with the exact same things like this meeting today like uh, supporting various uh, campaigns issues causes while building revolutionary socialist organization based on principle and based on sound work and hard work just like malcolm x would have said excellent thank you so much thank you everyone for a great meeting and um if you have any other comment i i i saw brian you uh you wrote something in the comments. Would you like to read it? Brian, are you there? Maybe I can. He wrote something about. Uh... Uh, I could just, it's just the, the famous quote from Malcolm X by any means necessary, mm -hmm. just how it articulates a revolutionary viewpoint. Yes. And, um, mm -hmm. and it, but also gives a tactical flexibility. It doesn't say, uh, it means we have to be able to have different tactics in different situations as well. So that was the only point I wanted to make. Yeah. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you so much, everyone, again. And uh, I have announcements also. Thank you so much, Mohammed. That was very, very interesting. Thank you. And uh, everyone, if you want to stay a little after we're done, but I have announcements to some announcements. Um, one of them is the MGH incident on June the 10th. I'm not sure if people heard of them, but it was um, black construction workers working at St. Mike, at Michael Guerin Hospital, uh, the construction site. They found nooses hung up around their workplace. Um, it was an unmistakable message of hate. So um, there is going to be an action and there is a Facebook action that it's happening on the, um, I think it's gonna be on the June the 30th. So, and um, at the beaches East York MPP also, Rima Burns and Toronto Down for MPP, Peter Taverns are holding a public forum on Tuesday regarding this incident. There is also um, the No Pride in Policing rally on Sunday. And that's also some other events happening. Uh, rally in Nathan Phillips Square, ASL interpretation will be available for people. And there is uh, Black Lives Matter Canada demands in in uh, Facebook. I have a lot of Facebook events, so they're going to be posted on Facebook. If you're interested, you can go there as well. All the uh, events have been uh, recorded, so they can be found in the socialist.ca. So you, if you're interested, you can go there as well. And, uh, and that's about it. Thank you so much, everyone. And anybody who wants to uh, make a comment or anything at all? Hey, it's Darren, it's Darren. Darren. Darren, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for the presentation. Excellent job from all the speakers who uh, spoke and asked questions. Uh, an excellent job. Uh, we got to keep up the good work today. This is not an opportunity. It has to be a moment. So uh, just encourage everybody as well, just to keep up the good work. Let's, let's make this happen. Thanks, Darren. Darren. So maybe I can leave off with a 30 second piece just to sure. wrap things up on a nice, on a nice bowl. Okay, sounds good. So this is the first verse from my Daughters of Asada record and goes a little something like this. Okay. We them overseas kings turned slaves by overseers. We them beauty queens turned to booty jeans over sneakers. Once announcers, but we're left without an ounce of freedom. We've been Willie Lynch, we've been pounced and beaten. The sand strip first they banned it, then we were branded bandits. Yet and still we can't quit taking on this land trip. Yo, 
ran down to the ground like sowing seeds of cotton, but the fruits of the slaver smell like something rotten. The land of freed slaves sure came bitter sweet. Just like Alabama, strange food hang by its feet. No retreat from defeat. We meet the deceit and open combat. Arms stacked on that war drum beat. Us the sons of Madiba, daughters of Asada. Resistance in sonnets? No need to raise an armament to raise revolution. That's that Nat Turner. Don't need no gap burner, because we pack that sojourner. <laughs>